So it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure to represent an industry, really, uh, today. And I, I appreciate the invitation. My subject matter is, is kind of broad and complex. So that means my talk is going to be a little bit high level. But I'll try to uh, zero down onto some key breakthroughs over the history of the hard drive, some of the physics behind that. And then I'll, um, towards the end of the talk, I'll talk about some of the more recent things we're trying to do to extend the roadmap and bring in some interesting physics, I think. Things like uh, plasmonics, which was mentioned in the previous talk, spin torque oscillators, uh, and other things like that. So let me start with a marketing-like slide that I took from our marketing department. So historically, yes, the, the storage has been local, right? It has served local applications. Uh, today, we're moving much more into the cloud. And uh, that means that you have a, a storage pool that is much larger in size, typically. So whereas you know, historically, we've gone up to terabytes of local storage, in the cloud, uh, typically, you're in many exabytes uh, and on up uh, in terms of uh, data centers. And then that's being accessed, of course, within a radius of hundreds or even thousands of miles. And so this is actually a good thing for the hard drive. So the hard drive um, has competition has competition from NAND flash memory, which tends to serve, uh, which is more expensive and serves smaller, uh, uh, smaller capacity type applications. Hard drives, especially in this exabyte scale or even the tens of terabytes or more, is vastly uh, cheaper. And so that's why it still dominates today and it's expected to continue to dominate in the future in terms of cloud storage. Okay, and that's shown by this chart here. So about 70% of the world's information is stored on hard disk drives. I think that's an underappreciated fact. Um, other storage media has included optical, tape, and more recently flash memory. Flash memory is uh, growing in terms of revenue faster than other storage methods. But in terms of bulk storage and in terms of total bytes, uh, hard drives are expected to continue to dominate and be greater than 70%. And in the data center, probably on the order of 90%. It's about 90% today. That's also expected to continue. And after I talk a little bit about the history of the hard drive and come back to what we're trying to do today, hopefully people will be convinced that, that uh, the, the death of the hard drive is, is, is not so eminent right now. Okay. So this shows some examples of hard drives through the years. So the, the, the RAM Mac was, was invented by IBM back in the 50s. It took up an entire room. Um, it uh, stored information about two kilobits per square inch. Just keep that in mind. And you had 50 two-foot diameter disks, uh, the total storage was about five megabytes, right? And through the years, um, hard drives have generally shrunk in size. So in the, uh, in the 80s, um, there was a very famous hard drive that was almost like a big turbo pump in terms of its size. It's called 3380, and it just made a ton of money for IBM. It was a very, very uh, successful product. Um, and it stored information, you know, about, about uh, say, 10,000 times more d uh, denser than the original RAM Mac. And then you go to the early uh, 2000s, and this is where the hard, the hard drive industry really got crazy about shrinking hard drives to very small size, and it was successful for a while. Uh, so this is a picture of what uh, IBM was calling the Mikey drive at the time, which was a one-inch drive. Uh, and there are also 1.8-inch drives that were quite common at this time period. And this is when iPods became popular. Actually, it was these small hard drives that enabled Apple to become a consumer products company in the very beginning uh, because of these, these small hard drives. Um, however, these are really too small to compete with NAND flash memory long term. And I think the industry realized this early on. They realized that uh, NAND flash at that time was not a very competitive industry. There were two players at the time. Margins were very high. It was nothing like DRAM, for example, at that time. So it was relatively easy for people to predict that when flash becomes like DRAM in terms of commoditization, in terms of revenue per wafer, uh, that the cost was going to drop by close to a factor of 10. And that's exactly what happened over the next five years or so. And so that means that these small hard drives went away, basically. Um, and today, the, the fastest growing part of our market are three and a half inch drives. So it's kind of a happy medium where we can get very, very high capacity, low cost per bit. And we're actually hermetically sealing them uh, in helium. So it's almost like we're making a little tiny vacuum chamber or something. We're packing it with helium that doesn't leak out and we get much better performance. We can actually lower the cost per bit that way. And so I'll talk about that. OK, and then this shows long-term uh, kind of Moore's law for hard drives. So starting from the, starting from the RAMAC drive here uh, and going through a number of innovations. And the ones in yellow I will briefly highlight on separate slides you know, uh, in my talk. Uh, 
Uh, you can see, though, overall, the uh, aerial density has grown by almost a, fac almost a factor of a billion since that, uh, the, the first RAMAC. So it's a very impressive, I think, long-term history. And there's been a number of innovations, some of which actually have resulted in the Nobel Prize, other very important innovations uh, more recently. And at the end of my talk, I'll talk about energy assist, which is the most recent technology that involves some interesting uh, physics. But, okay, hard drives are a mechanical device. I think because of that, it's not considered a very sexy technology. And so as Rodney Dangerfield would say, hard drives sometimes don't get all that much respect, but I think that the history uh, dictates that it really should. Okay, and then I'm just gonna very quickly describe the major components of a hard drive, okay? So you have a card. The card uh, uh, has a number of functions. Of course, it, it's the controller for the disk drive. It encodes the written data. It decodes the data that it takes off the hard drive. It provides uh, uh, waveforms on the read and write uh, uh, inputs and outputs uh, via a flex cable that goes out to the read and write elements. Now there's an actuator. The actuator is a pivot actuator with a voice, a voice coil uh, magnet here, a voice coil motor, or VCM, that uh, swings the, uh, the, the uh, slider, which is on the end of a suspension, out over the disc. If you look a little bit more closely, if you do a kind of an extreme close-up, here's this uh, suspension that I mentioned. And then at the very end of this suspension, you can see in this optical image, this is the slider. The sliders are pretty small. They're hard to see with the naked eye. This is basically a bunch of sliders on a dime. And on a typical eight inch wafer, we make about 100,000 of these. So you can imagine that, that if you make 100,000 devices on a wafer, just like a, a laser actually, you can put a lot of interesting physics, a lot of exotic materials, and you can use a lot of processing steps and the thing still comes out really dirt cheap. So if you zoom in further here, uh, this is the slider body. And then if you look at the bottom, the part that faces the disc, there's, an, there's a, what's called an air bearing or airfoil at the bottom. So this allows this thing to fly over the, surf of the, over the surface of the disk by only a few nanometers, extremely close. And the read and write elements take about 1,000 process steps. So this is actually, this here is the surface of the wafer that's used to fabricate these sliders. Uh, the substrate is a ceramic material, um, but the processing on top is about 1,000 process steps. And that's because we make some very complicated three-dimensional type shapes for the read and write elements. Um, and and we can afford it. We can afford to have that many process steps uh, without the cost being so severely impacted. And of course, the read and write elements are on the nanometer scale, a few tens of nanometers in size, and they're right at the corner of this, of this slider. So another way to think about scale, which is kind of fun, is to take the hard drive and increase its size by a factor of a million, but keeping the data rate the same, okay? So if you were to do that, that means that instead of 95 millimeters, the disk would be 95 kilometers. So it'd be roughly this size on a map uh, for the Bay Area, right? And so if you think about the slider, the slider would be analogous to a 747, just like the slider is flying. You have a 747 that's flying above the surface of the Earth by only four millimeters as it goes around this, this large area, right? So you, have, you imagine that the disk has to be extremely smooth and extremely flat, and, sh and sure enough it is because it's only four nanometers. And because the data rate we're keeping the same, that means instead of a slider moving at about 10% of the speed of sound, which is how fast it actually moves, it would have to move at about 10% of the speed of light in this case uh, to have that data rate. And then finally, the bits are about the size of your finger in this blown up example. So just to give you a sense of scale, and then you take that mental picture and then you try to shrink it by a factor of a million. And then that would be a hard drive. Okay, so I'll talk about, so one major innovation that was on this previous slide, if I go back real quick uh, here, uh, is the transition from long, what's called longitudinal recording to perpendicular recording. I think that's a good way to describe a little bit more about the read-write process. So let me go forward here. So over the most of the history of the hard drive, uh, we have longitudinal recording, and that meant that the magnetic bits on the disk were recorded in the in-plane direction you had a very small electromagnet, which is uh, about 10 microns in size. You have a right coil then that generates uh, an MMF, and you get a fringing field across a gap. And that fringing field then is in the longitudinal direction, and that writes these, these bits. And then you have uh, some kind of a reader which uh, changes its resistance depending on the magnetic fields that are generated by the bits on the disk. 
Now there's a transition uh, to perpendicular recording that happened in the early 2000s. And this, this uh, uh, was a big boost to the industry. It basically allowed us to increase our compound annual growth rate significantly because things had really started to level off at about that time. The nice thing about perpendicular recording, where the bits are recorded perpendicular to the surface of the disk, is that it's much more magnetically stable. The, the diamagnetic fields that are coming out actually can support high frequency recording on the disk. And you can generate higher magnetic fields because you can put what's called a soft magnetic underlayer in the disk underneath the recording layer. And so you end up creating a kind of a mirror image of the pole in this magnetic soft underlayer. And you can generate stronger magnetic fields, uh, especially in the perpendicular direction. So this was an idea that was pioneered actually in the 70s by Professor uh, Iwazaki, Iwazaki in Japan at, at uh, Tohoku. And it was first, it was first commercially uh, successful in about 2005. The first company that shipped it was Toshiba, but then very quickly all the other companies in the industry uh, shipped at that time. Of course, another big story in the history of hard drives are spin valves and, and uh, tunneling heads. Um, so, the, uh, so the giant magnetoresistive effect uh, was, of course, uh, resulted in the Nobel Prize in 2007. And it involved basically <clears throat> the fact that you have spin-dependent scattering uh, at an interface, depending on the orientation of the, magnetic, uh, the uh, magnetization in that, uh, in that layer at the interface. Um, and when this was uh, first uh, invented, it very, very quickly came into hard disk drives. And I think IBM was the first company to commercialize this, and it gave them a huge advantage. And if you didn't catch up and start shipping this technology very quickly, you were out of business. In fact, in the 80s, there are about 45 hard disk drive companies. Today, there's two and a half companies left in the world. So there's been a huge consolidation over the years. Some of that consolidation, I think, is driven by technology advances like this. But a related technology is the TMR head. So uh, TMR was something that was actually discovered in the 70s. Um, and it, can, it was introduced into hard drives shortly after GMR. And it involved, so similarly, instead of spin-dependent uh, scattering at an interface, you have spin-dependent tunneling across a tunneling barrier. And then to give you a sense of scale, today, the tunneling barrier in a hard drive is uh, typically magnesium oxide. It's about one nanometer thick. And then the device itself is about 25 nanometers across. Another invention that was about this time, that was developed about this time, was hermetic, hermetic sealing. There's no fancy physics involved here, but it was still very important to the industry uh, and is today and is the fastest growing part of the market. So one thing to realize that inside a hard drive, you tend to have very large Reynolds numbers, right? And the drag at high Reynolds numbers is proportional to the density of the gas times the velocity to the third power. So that means that your drag is proportional to the density. Helium is about seven times less dense than air. So you have much less drag if you put helium in a hard drive. Uh, it also has very high thermal conductivity. So this, this can give you some very nice cooling inside the hard drive. So you get lower turbulence. You get a big reduction in power, especially the spindle power that keeps the disk moving, uh, a reduction in acoustics and temperature. And the sealing approach was invented and demonstrated in the early 2000s. And the, some of the ideas were borrowed from the aerospace industry or from the uh, AC industry. Uh, but it basically involves uh, using the type of seals that helium can't leak through, so metal-to-metal -metal seals or metal-to-glass seals, and to do it in a very economical way, which is necessary for hard drives. So one of the key things there is to use uh, a cast, still continue to use a casting. Uh, so this is a cast aluminum base. The casting is, is, tends to be porous, so uh, it took a long time to perfect the casting to make sure that it, was not, it wasn't so porous that helium could leak through it. And it was also very important to develop the right kind of materials that could allow a nice metal-to-metal -metal laser weld between the secondary top cover and the base casting. Using a secondary cover is very nice. It means you can go through the entire manufacturing process with one cover, and then at the very end, before you ship it, you backfill it with helium, and then you do this laser welding of this uh, special alloy on top. And then so we developed this technology, okay? So maybe it was... Maybe the research was in the early 2000s, but it wasn't shipped for almost 10 years. And that's because, well, there's lots and lots of details that have to be worked out. You have to perfect the base casting. You have to get the yield up, cost down. You have to be able to get the suppliers to ramp in volume. But all this was done. Um, and the, the way that it really was implemented 
and gave a huge advantage in terms of cost is that because the turbulence is very low and the drag is very low, you can put a lot more discs inside and you can make the disc really thin. It, you know, it can, typically if you make it too thin, there'll be too much turbulence and you get too much vibration. But with helium inside, you can make the disc really thin. You can put a lot of discs in there and you can lower, you can increase the capacity and lower the cost per bit. So that was implemented and you know, we got 50% more storage capacity, much a big reduction in power, uh, lower temperature, and a better reliability spec, better reliability than the conventional drive. That's also because we can control not just the atmosphere inside, but also the humidity uh, and the contaminants inside this enclosure. Today, we've already shipped more than uh, 20 million, so the revenue's in the billions of dollars, and it's the fastest growing part of, the, of our business. Okay, now I'm gonna move on to the problem today, the problem is, is that is what's called the super paramagnetic effect. Um, and it's why hard drive technology has really started to slow down in the last few years. You know, back in the, uh, back in the 90s when we had GMR, you know, Nobel Prize, and we had 80% compound annual growth rate. Today, the kegger is only about 10% per year because we're really bumping up against fundamental physical limits. And this has to do with the fact that the grains inside the, the disk are about eight nanometers across, seven or eight nanometers across. If you make them any smaller, then they will thermally flip within 10 years, and you need the data to last five or 10 years in a hard drive. That means that the energy barrier is, that needs to be larger than about 70 times KT to have good thermal stability. You can't do that today below seven nanometers using the materials we use today. So we'd like to, and this is a picture, by the way, of the uh, typical grains. You can see the atoms uh, in these grains for scale. The pitch between these grains is about, is about eight nanometers. And the number of grains that contributes to a bit in terms of the readback signal is about 10. There's about 10 grains that uh, contribute to your readback signal. So what we'd like to do is use materials that have a larger energy barrier. Uh, and a great material for that is what's called iron platinum L1O. So it's a chemically ordered phase of, of iron and platinum. It has an anisotropy density and an energy barrier that's about 10 times higher than the cobalt platinum chrome material we use today. Unfortunately, that also means the coercivity of that material is several tesla. You can't create a magnetic field with an electromagnet in the several tesla range. Um, so we need to use an energy assist. We need to figure out a way to get some energy across this, this two to four nanometer gap inside of a hard drive to um, assist in the switching process. And so there are two technologies for that. One is called hammer, or heat-assisted magnetic recording, and this uses a plasmonic antenna to get the heat across that gap. The other technology is called MAMR, or, or microwave-assisted magnetic recording, and it uses a spin-torque oscillator to get microwave fields across that small gap to excite the uh, grains in the disk and transfer energy that way. So uh, this is another chart that summarizes the technologies that are either entering the marketplace today or, will, or are expected to in the near future. The two that are more evolutionary rather than revolutionary are called shingled magnetic recording, where the tracks on the disk are actually overlaid in one direction. That means you can no longer update a track in place, but it means you can squeeze the tracks closer together when you do this, and you don't have to worry as much about erasing the data on the adjacent track. And it turns out you can create a larger magnetic field also this way because the tracks can be a little bit bigger when you write them. Uh, another technology, but this only gives you about say 10 or 15% in aerial density. Two-dimensional magnetic recording basically involves having more than one readback sensor for reading back the data. And then you can basically average the, the, uh, the readback waveforms together and you can increase the signal to noise ratio that way. This is, a, this is a little bit more expensive, but not too bad. And it can give you something on the order of 5% or more in aerial density, but not much more than that. These other technologies, though, in principle, can get you about a factor of four in aerial density. So it could, it could last for uh, the next decade. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna spend the last part of my talk especially focusing on Hammer, because this is the technology that is, has the most backing in the industry. It's, uh, it's the primary technology on the uh, industry uh, consortium's roadmap, for example. And also, it's the technology that I work on, so I'm a little bit biased. Uh, so, but I would say Hammer is the primary scalable technology. This will allow us to get from one terabit per square inch up to about four terabit per square inch. We have to use this new media, iron platinum, um, and so that has a host of challenges related to that, but it can, in principle, allow us to scale to much smaller grain size, down to about four or five nanometers. Um, and another thing about this uh, recording process is that as you 
as you heat up the media and you get close to the curry temperature, the coercivity actually drops very, in a very nonlinear fashion. And that means as the grains freeze, there's an effective field gradient given by this chain rule down here, which could be extremely large. And that means you can get very sharply written transitions. You can get effective field gradients that are several times higher than the conventional recording. And that's also necessary to get these bits packed closely together. So um, the part I work on is really the plasmonics and the head uh, for hammer. Um, and so in this kind of uh, uh, head, you have to have a laser diode. The laser diode is mounted on top of the slider. Uh, you couple into a waveguide. And then the light in that dielectric waveguide ends up at the bottom where there's a plasmonic antenna near the air bearing surface. There's an extension of this technology that's called heated dot magnetic recording, just to, just to give one more acronym and one more technology. But this is really an extension of hammer. And what it involves, it involves patterning the disk surface into small islands. Um, and what this does is it actually improves the near field optics between the plasmonic antenna in hammer and the disk, so it can allow for scaling that way. And also, instead of having 10 random grains representing one bit, you have one lithographically defined island that's defining your bit. So that means the bits can, in principle, be smaller as long as you can make them at low cost. Um, and so that's the biggest trouble with this uh, patterning technology. Typically, this involves imprint lithography at very, very high manufacturing rates and very low cost, and the industry has not been able to achieve the economics necessary um, at this point in time. So this is considered the last technology on the roadmap. But it is the most scalable technology. And it was first demonstrated in the late 2000s, where even back then already we had about one uh, teradot per square inch demonstrated. And that's because of the very favorable physics with this technology. This is the recording process in Hammer. And so the top view graph shows the magnetic field generated by the magnetic part of the head. This is the uh, thermal spot in the disk that defines the track width and is generated by our plasmonic antenna in the head. And then this is the magnetic field pattern that's written into the media. So you can see that the, what defines really the track width is the thermal field. The magnetic field is just there to bias the grains as they freeze down through the curry temperature. Uh, and so really the thing that does the heavy lifting is this, uh, is this thermal spot that's generated in the disk. And that thermal spot has a peak temperature of about 500 C. And remember, this thing is traveling so fast, you have to heat up the media in about a nanosecond and cool it back down in about a nanosecond. So to show a little bit more detail of how this process works, the laser diode has, is, a, is an edge emitter, typically. It has a wavelength around 850 or 830 nanometers, so it's in the near infrared. And the reason for that is we tend to use gold or materials that are similar to gold as our plasmonic antenna. And they have good plasmonic properties in the near infrared. Um, there's a spot size converter that converts the mode size from the laser, which is about two or three microns in size, down into a high contrast dielectric waveguide where the mode size is about 10 times smaller. So that means the intensity of the light goes up by about a factor of 100 using the spot size converter that's built into the uh, slider. That waveguide then goes through the back gap of our magnetic rider, the yoke of our magnetic rider. And at the very bottom, you have uh, typically a gold plasmonic antenna, and then of which just one example is shown here. This is a kind of an older design that we called the E antenna. So this material here, this is all gold. Um, and this shows basically the charge density on the surface of the gold. There's a, there's a surface plasmon local resonance that's set up between this corner and this corner. Uh, and that's given when this length is about 300 nanometers. You get this resonance effect. And then you get a concentration effect just because of the sharpness of this notch. So you get something that's more analogous to a lightning rod. So you can think of uh, surface plasmon being excited by the waveguide. You can think of this uh, local plasmon and then lightning rod effect. All this works in concert to give you an extremely intense uh, oscillating charge, uh, uh, like monopole charge, in this tip region. And then what happens next is that this acts like one plate of a capacitor. The other capacitor plate is the disk because it's metallic. So you're basically oscillating an AC capacitor at the optical frequency, which is like 100 uh, terahertz or something like that. And then that causes uh, joule heating, basically resistive losses in the disk. That causes, causes joule lo losses, and that causes the heating of the disk. So it's a rather indirect process. And then that's what actually gives rise to one of the biggest challenges of this technology, which is the efficiency 
and the heat that's generated in this process because it's indirect. So you know, the laser diode may have a quantum efficiency of about 40%, and we should be able to get more than half of that light through this uh, spot size converter and down to our NFT, or plasmonic antenna. But the plasmonic antennas tend to be only about 5% efficient. So at the end of the day, less than 1% of your wall plug power actually makes it into the disk as joule losses. Um, and so the amount of energy that's needed to heat up the disk is typically about 1,000 times higher than what you might use in uh, certain optical techniques like near-field optical microscopy. Some people also like to talk in terms of the, the uh, radiation intensity at the surface of the, of the sun, and it turns out it's actually much higher than, uh, than that intensity at the surface of the sun. So anyway, you can imagine that there's a problem with, with heat being generated. We certainly don't want this plasmonic antenna to be much hotter than the disk, for example. The disk is at 500 C. The head, we can tolerate 200, maybe 300 degrees, no higher than that, or else the reliability will be a big challenge, and is today. So the industry is working very hard, especially on not only making this process more efficient, but also improving the robustness of the materials that are used, especially at the very apex of this plasmonic antenna. So for example, gold is not a very stable material, especially the surface of gold is not very stable at a couple hundred degrees C. The surface diff diffusivity, the energy barrier for diffusion on the surface of gold is only about half an EV. Um, and we need that to be well over an EV to have good stability. So we're working on new materials that can replace the gold itself, especially right at the tip apex, and also better adhesion layers or wetting layers that uh, will allow better wetting of the gold and less surface diffusion of the gold, which results in rounding of the antenna. Okay, and then my last couple of slides, just to give a kind of an outlook or industry view. So, you know, today we have perpendicular magnetic recording. This is aerial density in the vertical axis. It's slowing down. We think the limit is about 1.1 terabit per square inch. We have these other technologies like shingled recording and multiple readers that we think can guess a little bit higher, around 1.4. But to go higher, we really need energy assist, right? We run into this, this uh, super paramagnetic limit. We need to change the materials. We need, we need to get some energy across the gap. And so we ne either need to use spin torque oscillators or plasmonic antennas to get that energy across the gap and then get to around 4 terabit per square inch. Ultimately, if we can figure out how to pattern the disk, we could get to 10 terabit per square inch or more by combining the technology of patterning the media and the, um, and the hammer technology. OK, and then from an economic point of view, we really need energy assist to work. Uh, because we have a competitor, which is uh, flash memory. Fortunately, the company I work for has both NAND flash memory and hard drives. Nevertheless, uh, uh, we would like uh, hard drives to continue to be profitable in the future. To do that, we really need energy assist to work, to keep on our roadmap and reduce the uh, cost per bit. Today, especially with these big capacity helium hard drives, we still have about a factor of 10 in cost per bit. And the roadmap from 3D NAND is around 20% per year. Uh, dropping to around 15% per year. For us to do the same, we really need this technology to work. Okay, so thank you very much. I'll take questions. Uh, terrific talk. Thank you very much. Uh, I should mention that the uh, speaker is the inventor of the helium-filled uh, hard disk. Uh, so uh, let me uh, uh, invite questions. Uh, back in the stone age of uh, hard drive technology at IBM, our biggest uh, challenge was HDI, head disk interactions. Mm -hmm. uh, I take it this, you didn't mention anything about this, so I, I guess it's a solved problem. <laughs> <coughs> uh, no, it's not really a solved problem. It's, it's probably, HDI tends to be the thing that that causes firefights when new, you know, new products are released, just like they were back probably in the 80s or the 70s. Um, very, very important. And actually, these new technologies like MAMR and HAMR have a host of HDI-related challenges, which I just didn't have time to get into. But yeah, we can talk about it later if you yeah. want. A very yeah. big issue, yes. Yeah. The uh, nanometer scale, diamond-like carbon coatings, the lubricant, the humidity, the water molecules on those surfaces, the roughness, very, very important and complex uh, problem. OK, uh, let's uh, invite some more questions. I, I think, uh, yeah, you go ahead. Uh, would you 
a bit about uh, RAM, uh, MRAM. Uh, okay, yeah, well, I'm certainly not an expert on MRAM, um, but I think MRAM is considered to be more expensive than, than flash memory, for example. I think NAND flash and 3D NAND flash is expected to remain the, le the least expensive, maybe the lowest performing solid state technology for the future, followed by something like RAM, followed by MRAM. In other words, MRAM, my, my understanding is that they have challenges with both 3D integration and scaling even in two dimensions. So the cost per bit is expected to be high, but the performance very high. So I think people think of it more as a DRAM uh, challenger than a flash memory challenger. Okay. Um, yeah. Thank you. Uh, this might be a dumb question, but why is uh, diffraction limit not a problem when you're focusing a laser to 100 nanometers? Yeah, so well, we use surface pl uh, plasmons so um, actually the thing that determines the size of the spot is the size of this capacitor plate at the bottom. Uh, because you can, below the diffraction limit, when you have surface charge that's moving back and forth, that gets confined by this uh, notch or apex. Uh, that forms one half of a capacitor plate. And then because you're so far be below the wavelength, it really acts a lot more like electrostatics than uh, propagating waves at that point. So it's really the size of that capacitor plate that will determine the size of the image capacitor plate in the disk. Yeah, I should mention in uh, relation to that, uh, that in the experiments of Heinrich Hertz, uh, when he discovered radio, he also discovered the antenna, and uh, he was also uh, focusing energy deep sub-wavelength, uh, but he was using uh, spheres at the ends of his antenna, and then the spheres would get very close together. And uh, it, just in the very dawn of radio, already there was tremendous uh, concentration of electromagnetic fields. Uh, let me ask one question. If helium is good, why isn't vacuum even better? Well, you have to fly. You have to have a way, uh, of, you have to have a way of controlling this gap to uh, less than a nanometer. So typically the back off today is about two nanometers, and the, the overcoats are on the order of two nanometers also on the head and the disc. And you have to maintain that fly height under a variety of atmospheric conditions, pressure, temperature, and everything. And so it's actually an amazing art form to make these air bearings on the surface of the slider in order to maintain that fly height so accurately. In addition, we have a, basically a very small actuator that's thermal in nature that has an actuation distance of about 10 nanometers that allows us to adjust that fly height also, uh, which I didn't mention. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm.